my training was absolutely perfect. I was feeling really fit. And this guy had come along and just put in this huge performance. And I thought, wow, okay, we're, we're going to have it all on for the race. You're doing a sprint, you know, you're doing a minute event. So like everything says threshold is pointless. Whereas I actually think having a bit of metabolic flexibility and general fitness will enable you to recover between efforts, between sessions, between weeks and just carry smooth into the event. So we did a lot of that. The hardest bit about 500 meter is the mentality. I just have a huge mental block about doing a 500 because I think every time I step on the machine to do a 500, I have the idea that I have to break the world record. If you did a VO2 session, say, and you went so hard that you couldn't do anything for the next three days, you'd look back and you'd be like, this was wrong. And he said, this is going to be very different to anything you've ever done before, but I need you to buy in 100%, because if you don't do it 100%, there's no point doing it. Welcome to the Upside Strength Podcast, the show that will help you get your health and your performance to the next level. Whether you're a recreational or competitive athlete, a coach, a physio, or even just someone who's curious about sport, sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode. All right, Phil, Johnny, welcome to the podcast. How are you guys doing? Phil, go first. Hi. <laughs> um, yeah, good. Thanks. I'm uh, I'm okay. A little bit husky. Um, voice has gone a bit, but uh, yeah, pleased to be here. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. It's a pleasure. Johnny, how are you? I'm very good. I'm not quite as uh, deep and sexy as Phil, but we'll 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 survive. That's okay. He'll explain why his uh, voice is a little raspy today. We'll we'll get into that later. Um, okay, I wanted to have you guys on to talk about uh, the big event that happened on the 26th of March, which was Phil's breaking of the 500 meter uh, indoor rower world record. Uh, so first of all, congratulations, Phil. Congratulations to you guys as a as a team. Uh, but for those who don't know you yet, I wanted to go through a quick intro. So, Phil, could you please uh, tell us who you are and what you do? Hi, um, I'm Phil Clapp. I would class myself as a professional yachtsman with a touch for training indoor rowing in the winter. <laughs> but I am also now currently the 500 meter indoor rowing world record holder. Fantastic. How about you, Johnny? Uh, Johnny, I'm a performance scientist for Ineos Grenadiers. Um, I, I've been coaching, well, I, I, would you say I coach, help, advise, point, ask stupid questions. Would you mind doing this, Phil? <laughs> I have an idea. <laughs> <laughs> Let me play with you. <laughs> when do you guys start working together? Two and a half, two and a bit years. Yeah. Two, two and a bit years. Yeah. It's a bit off and on because, because of the sailing in the summers it becomes kind of it's more kind of winter projects and then trying to hold the physiology all together in the summer okay so much. kind of an more of an overview during your sailing season and then maybe more uh yeah. specific programming when uh, when you go to attack some fun records like the like the indoor rower yeah that's exactly how i would call it all right i like it um phil can you tell us a little bit of the backstory behind the 500 meter and its its history and uh what you've you know followed over the years and done over the years regarding that distance on the indoor roar so let's start start let's we could pretty much wind back 10 years actually which is an awfully long time when you say it like that so um i used to row on the water ended up having some fairly horrible back injuries retired from water rowing um and then i had a break and it was probably in the about 2013 2014 um i forget why something happened and i started looking and i was like oh sp sprint rowing records came up or something and they were all quite old the records and there was it was pretty niche at that point right instagram didn't really exist there was a little i don't really know i think it was a bit on facebook it was very very niche market and i ended up just sort of going oh let's have a try i'd like always used to be fairly powerful as a kid up through the thing i was probably more powerful than i was better at the long stuff oh let's have a punt i think i remember just in in my parents garage just we had there go just giving it some and i think i did something like a 500 that was i don't know something springs to mind about a 113.7 or something and i went oh seems quite good look on the record board oh that's quite good and then i saw this you go on the records and you see this time and it's 110.5. Wow, that seems really quick. Um, and I was like, oh, it's from 1990. That was when I was born. 
wow, that's an old record. Because when you watch other sports and they're on TV, and pretty much most of the records are sort of within the last two, maybe five years, and then occasionally you get a massive outlier. And to me, I saw this and I went, wow, that's that's a crazy record um, set by a guy called Leo Young in Australia. So <clears throat> I kind of looked at it and went, oh, yeah. So I started chipping away, not really pressing that hard. And then I got into sailing. So I was sort of keeping fit. I got quite strong, quite heavy. So I think I was, I don't know, about 125 kilos. I got pretty strong at that point. I think around the 2015 time, I think I benched 200 kilos, um, which was my peak. And then it was actually about, I think it was 2017, We there was an event called the World Games, which is um, sort of a testing event. I think someone referred to it as a, a testing ground for sports that potentially could be viable to add to the Olympics. Mm. Um, and it was in Poland and there was sports. So indoor rowing was there. They had lacrosse. Um, they had some martial arts. I, I can't remember if it was Taekwondo or, or something like that. And there was lots of um, kind of other urban sports and stuff, but somehow um, from a junior row, um, I knew one of the you know, long stalwarts of indoor rowing in Britain, a guy called Graham Benton. And I remember he messaged me and he said, oh, look, there's going to be a 500 meter event at this World Games. Like, do you want to, you, you should have a go at qualifying. And I went, oh, like, that sounds quite fun. And I hadn't really, um, I can't remember if I'd done a British indoors at this point. Maybe I had, maybe, I can't quite. So anyway, I did a qualification time for they wanted to qualify the people in Britain and I ended up getting the fastest time. So great. Graham was doing the 2K. I was doing the 500. Um, so we ended up going to the event. And I remember I was doing some training before and I just didn't really know what I was doing. And I ended up just going. There was um, a guy called Sam Locke in Australia who was also trying to beat this 500 record and he was really going for it so there was all this content and he had all these ideas and he was strong he was posting all this stuff about oh how do I get faster and I was looking at stuff going wow I've never really seen anyone train like that before and I've definitely not seen a rower train like that before because usually the rags it's like oh we'll do hours and hours of really slow steady stuff and then some really average performance pieces um and there's nothing really specific whereas this guy was going I'm going to bow out 10 100 meter pieces at full throttle and I'm going to go faster than the record. I went, wow, no one's, I've never seen anyone train like this before. Like I've seen strong people, but I've never seen anyone do this. And um, so it was kind of a revelation watching him. He spent a lot of time trying to work up and I think he tested a lot of different methods. And he actually ended up, I think he did maybe, I want to say 111, something around there. He didn't quite get to the goal, but. He, he did a couple of repetitions at that it very well performed efforts and I, it, it stood like if you exclude the 110.5 that was on the record board it, he really produced some good scores so was that sorry to cut you up was that just before or after he went for the thousand because I, I was following him that back was then? after the thousand I it think was after right yeah I think he'd already he was already holding the thousand world record at that point mm. I'm pretty sure this was after so it was all around the time I went, did the race in Poland and was feeling pretty good. And I think I did, I ended up getting silver behind a Ukrainian guy and his name is it's just escaping me right now. He was an absolute monster. We're pretty much the same height, both sort of six, eight, six, nine. I think he was Olympic squad for Ukraine at that time. Mm. And he did something like a 111.2 or three still a crazy time for a race system and can, i did can you talk about remember. sorry again uh, the um, the difference between a race start and a standing start on uh on an indoor rower when you're by yourself can you just describe the difference for those who so, haven't did on the road um so standing start obviously there's no race system you can start whenever you like but the the kind of the mechanics of it is that when you start by yourself the first very small period when you pull the handle the flywheel is not actually moving very fast. So the timer doesn't start. And it's only once the flywheel reaches a certain velocity that the timer starts. So 
if you picture that now picture a race system you've got a countdown system and but when the clock strikes zero as long as you haven't full started your flywheel's still not moving because you haven't moved the muscle mm -hmm. so there's a reaction time so you have the timer from when it's clock strikes zero to when you see and you decide to actually push your muscles then you have the time delay from that point to when the flywheel starts moving fast enough to start registering a movement so it's those two elements that kind of add together to create this well, decrease in performance let's call it and i think that's probably worth um maybe about half a second right which right. on a two kilometer race isn't very much and because it doesn't vary um there's no differential but on a 500 meter race that's obviously quite a lot um so yeah that's a, it was a huge time for i still think it's probably one of the fastest race system times ever recorded or could mm. be i don't know so yeah that was um it was pretty much i i really don't like losing so when i got silver it was um pretty motivational even though i was doing some sailing and i think oh very lucky to sail with some great people um the following year i we won the sailing world championships but i in the maxi 72 on a boat called momo with just full of america's cup legends but i always thought there was more so then it was after that that i thought oh right i'd really like to kind of see what i'm capable of that i i think i remember looking it was kind of in that sort of 2018 period that i went oh i think i think i'd like to see if i can break this one 10.5 this mythical record and I pretty quickly realized that I'm going to need some help from someone else because I had stagnated. I'd got to A level, which was okay, um, but I just could not really get much faster. So that we needed to change something. Um, and it was actually, I forget what it was, one of my friends. Anyway, I'd heard about this guy who used to row at a club near me called Mulsey. Um, and there was this guy called Mehdi Cordy. People are like, oh, this guy, he, he's, he's gone to cycling. Like, he kind of knows a bit about rowing. He's gone and done cycling stuff, and he makes people go really fast on two wheels. And I was like, well, I don't think anyone has a clue what they're doing with sprint rowing in the rowing world. And they're so um, encapsulated with their ideas that no one wants to think outside the box. No one wants to try something new. And I went, right, well maybe maybe cycling's the way it, way it is like mm -hmm. let, let's try something completely new and Mehdi was a kind of in between because he had the knowledge of previously rowing so he knew the sort of mechanics of how it all has to work and then had the rest of the knowledge so I can't remember when we first spoke anyway we chatted and I was like oh can you give me a hand he was like yes of course let's let's try something this would be kind of a fun project to go and try something new so I can't I literally have cannot remember when we started working together, but it would be sometime in 20, 2019, maybe in the summer ish, slowly mm -hmm. started getting into it. So yeah, we kind of started working on the strength, trying some very different programming. And straight away I was like, I remember the first time he sent me a program and he said, This is gonna be very different to anything you've ever done before, but I need you to buy in a hundred percent because if you don't do it 100 percent. there's no point doing it i was like well fine I'm, I'm more than happy because what i'm doing isn't making me go any faster so he said the main issue with athletes especially once you get to the higher levels is wasn't so much for me because i my it didn't rely on my job right if you're an olympic if you're trying to make the olympics that is your job your body mm -hmm. is your profession and taking the risk to do something quite completely different completely out of the box is a huge risk and you can't undo you've only got a certain amount of time and you can't it's really hard to undo those changes but for me it was like well it doesn't really matter if I go slower I go slower whatever um it was all part of the process so we started working together um doing sprinty stuff and then to work through the winter and then ended up um yeah so broke the one minute record sometime around December of 2019, early 2020. We're like, oh, I think something's on here. And then shortly after that, equaled the existing 110.5. <laughs> um, 
Couldn't do it if you tried. But at the time, super happy, right? There's this crazy record. No one's, I think the closest anyone had, oh, sorry, I, I'll go on. Apart from Leo Young had got, um, no one had gone sub 111. So it was cool. Um, actually, just before I did that, there was a guy from the States called Lauren Howard who came on the scene, huge dude, 6'4", I don't know, 290 pounds of pure muscle. Did never never seen him before never seen him after anyway equaled the record very quickly it was it was amazing but it's not too much can't really say too much else so after i did my 110.5 went to the world champs which were in paris in person at that point and won with i, I can't remember the time I actually had an incredible time super fun event probably the best indoor rowing i've done since like till or since um and then i kind of been came off the high and then since then, I kind of been on and off, tried a bit of 1K, equaled the 1K world record, which was done by Sam Locke, mm -hmm. um, and then tried a whole different training programs and bits and ended up racing the 500 each winter. And I was kind of like, oh, I'd really like to have another run. And every winter, I just felt like there was unfinished business with the 500, that mm -hmm. my body was capable of something more but I hadn't quite unlocked it. And so I think I sort of um, said... Can I, can I interrupt you there, Phil? It's funny because you said you said all of like five minutes ago, you don't like losing. But every, everything that you said now is all about like, it's different. It's aspiring to, there's something out there that I think I can get. You know, that that's a different motivation, you know? Yeah, I think it, it's a bit of, there's a bit of both. I think to start me, I don't like losing. And the in-person racing, that's the only thing that gets me to finish a 500 meter is that I look on the screen and I see the other guy next to me going, oh, and I was like, I just really don't want to lose to him when even though it's really painful. So, yeah, there is almost two motivations and it depends day to day how I end up feeling. Um, this is the big like the big feedback I have is what happens if we had some other monster sat next to you on an erg? at the same time doing it the same day could yeah. we squeeze an extra little percent out? <laughs> yeah think, i think there's always it's really difficult right because there's definitely something in having someone sat next to you and i think i probably do respond well to that in the racing environment it works for me but also against that there's also when you're doing it by yourself and you have no time constraint you can start pulling at exactly the second that best suits your heart rate your breathing everything's right it's mm. all within your realm like you can start whenever you like there's something in there so there's kind of a you get gain a bit by having someone next to you but then you lose a bit maybe because it's a less flexible schedule i don't know um, but if we if we get to phil if we get to um you were getting to you were getting there last year's attempt 2022 yeah, sorry. Did, um, were, were you guys still already working together you were huh yeah um so last last year when i ended up racing a guy called cam from the from canada so i didn't end up going to the event just because i had a big year sailing and just the the cost and the dynamics of getting to canada for a 70 second event's quite a big undertaking so i did the british champs and then i knew i was going to race virtually um and he i saw he was doing massive time so it was he was probably the my most um, admired competitor that was closest to me for the whole time I've been rowing. Really nice guy, absolute monster, super strong in the gym, training really hard. And the impressive thing with Cam is he'd kind of started from similar level to me. So I kind of saw it like he he really, really put in the hours and the effort and it was all kind of building to this crescendo. Mm. Um, and I'd started working with Johnny maybe in September of that year. So we'd had quite a few months and I'd say um, the training was fairly similar to what I'd previously done with Mehdi, but also there was some distinct differences, um, which we can go on to later. So we went into the, we were building, building, building into this. Um, yeah, so then started very similar way to previous. I think it got to maybe January time. I can't remember the exact months. Anyway broke the one minute world record and went i think it was 109.6 wow that's okay we're really we're, we're flying now this is this is really big um 
and I probably got to some of my biggest strength levels. It was feeling really good. Um, and then we'd done a lot of testing, and that's something we can come on to later, on yeah, basically are. every variable on the ergo that's available to test. Um, so then, anyway, anyway, we got into, did the World Champs race, literally just won on the last stroke against Cam by 0.1 of a second. He was leading the entire race. Um, and yeah, just took it on the last stroke. I mean, I didn't do... <laughs> I think I threw my entire race plan out the window on the first stroke that I took. Uh, didn't really do it, but it kind of ended up going fine in the end. And then I think it was just after the World Champs, we'd sort of said, oh, well, right, we'll, we'll set a period and we're going to try and break the record in this period. Um, and it ended up doing two or three attempts. I can't remember. And they were all 110.9 and very different race plans. So it was really interesting in that respect because there was a lot of ways to end up at the same point and the very different ways, um, which we can talk about later. So finished that, won the world champs. Um, so actually, forget here, I broke the minute roll record and then Cam actually broke it again three days before the race. And that, I remember in my head, I was like, wow, this guy, this is the first time that I've ever really been beat. Like, I feel like my training was absolutely perfect. I was feeling really fit. And this guy had come along and just put in this huge performance. And I thought, wow, okay, we're we're going to have it all on for the race. So tick forward, done this. Um, tick forward, go back to sailing, get through the year. Um, this year, I made a really uh, distinct effort to work on my lower body strength, like especially on the off season dur during the summer kept fit but um i really wanted to make sure i was kind of bulletproofing my lower body um and we spoke with johnny we kind of made a plan roughly through the summer that we'd keep the endurance ticking over keep a little bit of vo2 max work in there and then just try and keep the strength going when i can when i was in britain so got through that did that for a few months pretty pretty unstructured no distinct plans really just kind of as and when and then I started doing my own thing, kind of working up, starting pushing from maybe, I would say, the very start of October last year, really started to ramp up, doing more performance efforts, um, starting to push the real high-end strength stuff. And then so it got about, to... About five months of... Uh, yeah, about five months. Um, and, and I would say the starting position, I was still pretty fit, right? When I... When I started, I still would be in a, a, a really good shape to do something quite good on both 500 and 1K. It's not, I keep, even though the sailing's not perfect for training, it still keeps me fit and I'm allowed, I can get enough in around it. So we're not starting from nothing. And then, so I was working, working, working. And then I can't remember when I spoke to Johnny and we had a long phone call and I said, I just, I actually think um, I'm in a really good position to do something really good. Like I could sort of see it coming. It, it's hard to see where your peak's going to be when you're just behind the peak. You just don't know how, because very quickly, a small amount of training, as we'll describe, you can it just get, you can just extend your speed so quickly, um, and it's all a guessing game. Just how how high that peak's going to be from your starting position. So, I said to him, "It's like oh, I think," and and. The one thing that Johnny, I find with Johnny is he's exceptionally motivating to me. Um, he really just gets into the the nitty gritty of a performance and how to create that performance when you work back in the days and the weeks before. And for me, the hardest bit about 500 meter is the mentality. I just have a huge mental block about doing a 500 because I think every time I step on the machine to do a 500, I have the idea that I have to break the world record. And there's no, there's no, I'm just going to complete it. And I'm just going to go to a time. It's like, if I'm stepping on it and I'm setting the screen, I, I want to break a record. So I said, look, let's, let, let's go for it. You're the only person that can motivate me enough to put myself through the pain that I know I need to go through to get there. So anyway, next to it, Johnny writes a program. I open the program. He's turned me into a lab rat. The program is more extreme than anything we've done before. And he's on the phone. He goes, "Oh, do you like this? Do you like this?" And I went, 
Well, I'm not sure I like it, but I'm hopefully I'll like the end result. Fast forward, I don't know, five, six weeks. Um, and we start getting into the taper. Uh, and I was like, oh, still quite tired. The pieces were good. I wouldn't say anything too crazy. Um, did, I would say that I completed the training program very well, like executed every session efficiently and ticked, got all the minutes completed, did everything. I had no illness and there was really nothing holding me back. So we get to the taper. I think I've probably had four light days by this point. Um, I remember I stepped on and did a, a kind of, we were starting to do a, a, it was the last hard session maybe. And I did a 37, 30 second maximal test and I just got on and I just felt like an absolute beast. Um, just got on, absolutely ripped the handle. And I was like, right, I, th I think we're on for something huge here. I went faster than anyone I'd ever, I think equal faster than anyone I'd ever gone. I think I did a 105 point something for 30 seconds, which was even I got off and I went, wow, okay. I didn't think I was, I thought I was going to do something quick, but I just didn't think it was going to be that quick. And I think we had, at the very start of the cycle, Johnny had said, look, and I agreed, we both agreed that the year before setting a week performance period was just too long for me. Mm. There was too many options and too many opportunities to go. Let's just put the handle down and we'll try another day. Um, it was actually More than a week, though. It, it was like, you think these are the story you told. It was we did the minute world record. Then we, yeah. did, then we did worlds. Then we did a little rebuild again. So another 500, then another 500. Yeah. And I think we did a, a, a 250. Yeah, uh, you know it, it, it's it's it was it's, a lot of it was kind of like this by the end so it was not. yeah it was a nice thing just to say okay on on the tuesday you're gonna do a 500 and you just need to make sure that day is your best so we've done this four days out i think I had a rest day and then the day before it's like right i'll just do a warm-up and then i'll just do i think i did a 20 second kind of just off the blocks I finished it. I went, right, I feel incredible. Like I could not feel any better. Everything was perfect. I had no niggles, no tiredness, the legs, just zero doms. And I remember finishing that day and I went for a walk with one of my best friends, Adam, who used to row in the squad and has done a 542k. And he said, oh, what, what do you think? And I said, honestly, if I feel like this tomorrow, it's going to be big and I'm going to break the record by miles. And he was like, yeah, yeah. And even says now, he's like, yeah, I thought you were just giving it the big one to try and motivate yourself. And I looked back and I was like, well, there was a bit of that, but also I just did think it was on the cards. And then the next day, I remember I woke up, I was in bed, let me, just kind of moving let me, my body around. Let me stop um, you, Phil, because I want yeah, to just kind of, I want to yeah. come back to that day of just after. Um, yeah. But yeah, that, that was a good build up on the history. I'm sorry to, to cut you in your... Uh, in your group, we're going to come back to it. I want to get a bit of Johnny's backstory as well. Um, Johnny, in the sense of you working with rowers, have you worked a lot with rowers? I know you work in cycling quite a bit. So before working with Phil, what was your exposure to the world of indoor rowing? Um, <clears throat> well, Phil's far more interesting than me. He, he broke the record. Um, uh, well, for, for me, I did a bit of rowing when I was young, uh, sort of 17, 18. I, I uh, I ruptured my groin and I, from swimming and I sort of transferred across to rowing because recovery is as good. Um, and I absolutely hated it. It was <laughs> it's everything I hate about sport. I enjoyed the, the on the water stuff, but um, yeah, I didn't like it at all. But then that sort of sat on the back burner for a few years. Um, and I guess with the, the link in with Phil is we talked about Medi and so Med Medi's one of my best friends. I guess he's one of Phil's good friends as well now. You know, it's... Um, I kind of got the like when when Phil sort of says when he first started talking to Medi, it was uh, it was around 2019 because I remember there was like we have a group chat with Dan and the cycling guys. He's like, guys, <laughs> I've got this monster. <laughs> Look what I can make him do. Kind of like a, you got sort of a little bit of exposure there there originally, just seeing what what crazy stuff he does, and I still it's still it's such a ridiculous record like if you just go to a gym and just try and do as hard as you can you're just like you're nowhere near it <laughs> it's like i think it's it's so out there um but so it was um obviously i was interested by all the fun stuff Medi was doing with phil before um had a little glimpse of it and i think probably a little bit 
background for the for the fans it was a uh, so medi medi's uh sprint cycling coach he did his phd on the determinants of sprint cycling um and his sort of uh his catchphrase if you will is prison big you've got to get big and strong it's all about the peak power you can produce and that was very similar to the sort of work that phil originally did in his plan with medi it was all about get big get strong um and that was kind of where he sort of like grew up through through that original cycle um and I guess the original sort of plans around a 500 is every single contraction is maximal and the you drop off because you, neuromuscularly you can't cope anymore. Um, so that's kind of like the where it sort of came from. And obviously Medi's, Medi's background in sprint and with Phil, that's kind of how it grew for two, three years. And when I sort of, you know, Phil can ask me to help, you know, it's like, what can I add to this piece? Um, and so we sort of added a lot more aerobic work really. And then we did a lot more sort of different pacing, pacing plans, gear plans, you know, it's, you know, the, I think as well as a lot of technique stuff as well, you know, I think the, the, the summer where you just sailed and did a bit of this and a bit of that, I think you actually introduced a lot of stuff that paid off on the day. You know, I know you've talked when you chat with Adam and when Adam just told you just to grab the oar and just rip it, you know, um, but you grabbed it and ripped it after 12 months of focused technique work and practice. Um, you know, it's, it takes a lot of work to get to that stage that you can still hold it up. Um, Cause I guess with me, it was like the, the variables you can change stroke length, frequency, more drag, drag factor, and then just peak power, you know? So it's like, mm -hmm. how do you manipulate these to go through? Um, and I think the, the, the big one that we sort of played around with the first year, cause like sort of Phil said is we, well, he basically just fucked around, you know. We were like, "What, what works?" You know. And I guess the beauty of Phil is that he's like super open to try anything. Like, you can come up with any crazy plan you want. You can find a random study out of your ass and be like, "Phil, I think this is going to work." You know. <laughs> we, we 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 joke. It's like, uh, you want to be eighty percent science, twenty percent bro science. You know, you need that little bit of like, I think this works. Um, so we sort of pulled a lot, a lot of the. Uh, well, a lot of the stuff from cycling that I knew because it was um I think with this sort of sprint rowing stuff like Phil said it's it's there's such a mental component mm -hmm. that if you if you if you were to set someone to do sprint rowing it you know three times a week all year round mentally the crack you know it's it's just not there so then it was right how can we make him aerobically fit how can we make him stronger without actually being on the erg you know so it's a lot lot more cross training than you probably did in the past did you know that i've recently started an all english youtube channel if you're not following me there yet please take a few seconds to go subscribe to the upside strength english channel and get access to hundreds of hours of free content and if we if we talk about we'll get to the training obviously if we Phil, you said you guys did every, you know, test in the book and every metric that you could, uh, you quantified it. So Johnny, if you can give us an overview of how did you approach that given the, the duration, given what you knew from cycling, where did you come at it with and what, what kind of tests did you set up first to, to get a baseline and to work from? Yeah, well, I guess one of my, one of my big problems is I don't like tests, you know, um, I think elite athletes don't test well, like the, the variability amongst these guys is so bad that you, you know you learn stuff within the within the signal um so with phil this was last year and like we talked about how we did we did multiple attempts we you know we did a, a, a minutes world rec yeah world champs world rec you know it was and it was always try something different mm -hmm. uh, i guess the, the, the big sort of difference we what i what my hypothesis was as you fatigue i want you to increase your stroke rate you know it was like mm -hmm. i think that's a way to compensate like you can't you can't contract as hard so let's increase the rate um and that that's something we sort of tried a bit last year, but I don't think it really worked properly because it wasn't it wasn't so ingrained and we we the fitness had dropped, the head had dropped. But um that that was the big one that I really thought would work. Um because it in, in a sort of cycling world, if you think if you're doing a one minute all out effort is what you're doing, like <clears throat> in that final piece, you shift into a smaller gear, increase cadence. You mm -hmm. know, so it's like what, will this work on an erg? Right. Um but the problems with that was you kind of a bit limited by how how quickly you can rate on the erg so this is where you had to sort of expose to even higher you know if you want to suddenly jump from doing 49 to 53 it's like it's a massive jump you have to be get used to rowing at 55 so there's a lot of little pieces that when phil was playing around in the summer having a go working on this sort of thing that enables you to actually action it it's it's um it's not to steal more of medi's ideas you know it's the you get the horizon or the ceiling you know which one do you improve 
Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, like I say, t- testing, it, it's easy, you know, especially this game, it's strap in and go. Um, the, 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 the thing you, you monitor is peak power. And I think the Phil says he, he was, he was strong around that sort of September time, like his peak powers, even though he hadn't done any pieces, if you know the peak power is there, you know the rest is there. It just takes, you know, you can add that enzyme buffering in really, really easily, you know, and it's and like it's kind of the flow in that final few weeks that I think is really good. Like Phil talking about, you know, it's, it's like I just felt like it was on, like fucking yes, you know, that's all. That's all what that final period is about. Because um, I'm I'm certain if if, you, if you'd ripped it at the start, then you still would have gone really fast. Because like all the data we have is that the peak power is there, the 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 <clears> minutes. <throat> Be there that's the anaerobic capacity it's done box ticked um but i don't really know what, what else we play around with did um did quite a few different things this year did was, the, there any, uh, was there any because you said like you said the tests are maybe i i uh misspoke a bit on that any what did you quantify in his training what what, what were the variables that were the most important to you on the erg and maybe even outside the erg did he use you know cycling as as cross training method or or even other ergs um how did you what what in your mind you talked about peak power obviously um what are the variables did did you see as you know front and center for for that performance um what did i see was important it, it, it honestly it's really boring it's just peak power like i, I don't think there's that it's it's not a it's not a <laughs> It's not a very complicated thing when we break it down, you know. It's so it's it's the, <laughs> having the the highest peak power and then filling in the back end. Yeah, essentially I, 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 it, yeah, exactly. And it, it's all the stuff around like I think if you, you, you there's two so you know any systems if we can pre we did a lot of the aerobic stuff to be able to tolerate more training at, around that final two three week period. So it's like all the sort of the threshold work like you know you're doing a, you're doing a sprint you know you're doing a minute event so like everything says threshold is pointless whereas. I actually think having a bit of metabolic flexibility and general fitness will enable you to recover between efforts, between sessions, between weeks, and just carry smooth into the event. So we did a lot of that around. Um, we did a lot of the heat tra- heat training with Phil for the last two years, which is um, again a bit different, you know. And it's um, we would use that that stuff that we learned through the hour records with um, Dan and Pipo. It was just the exact same protocol, you know, paint suit hour hour and 15 hour and 20 get hot stay hot nothing super complicated there or just I mean, did you do that year round or was there periods where you would you know put the yeah i i, I honestly i believe heat training all year round do it it's um what kind of frequency on the on a weekly basis were you looking at i think if i was to write a training program for anyone i'd put it one, once a week all year round okay, once a week stimulus. especially mm. especially so with it's quite low you think the the erg stuff is really high in neuromuscular fatigue whereas when you add the heat element you're just increasing you know he's effectively doing an hour at tempo slash threshold heart rate off yeah. what you know like metabolic like metabolically it's a big stimulus but you know from a muscular mechanical point of view it's quite low mm-hmm. um, so i'll add that yeah the <clears throat> that was the one because i'd never done it before i remember johnny last year it t- takes a little while to work out the dynamics of how you manage the heat training it does it, you you can't just jump into it. it you you need quite a few sessions to kind of learn how to manage everything around it um but definitely this year it was good because the minute we started going into it i knew exactly what how the protocol to work for me um and the it really really obvious is to me was that you could do a hard what a hard paint suit session You'd be really tired after, but the next day you'd wake up and your legs wouldn't actually be that tired because you've only been doing up 200 watts or something on the bike, which isn't, it's hardly anything, right? So you'd get this and the, the would enable you that you then, that to the next day or the day after, you could then do a huge neuromuscular maximal session on the erg, which you couldn't have done if you did um, an hour or plus at 300 plus watts on the bike to get the same heart rate. Yeah, I guess it's uh, that that heat component is is really interesting. I I work a lot in in CrossFit, and we used it for the first time with one of my athletes at the end of last year going into Dubai competition. Obviously, the conditions were going to be different there, and uh, obviously we condensed it a bit a bit more. She did two two to three sessions a week uh, leading up over the last month, and um, yeah, the improvement was significant, and also how she recovered during the the competition in the heat was tremendous, and I definitely see it as 
it's obviously gaining in popularity right now and it's already you know very present in, in cycling and uh in other in other um sports but it seems like it it definitely holds a lot of promise moving forward in terms of what it brings and like you said the you know the the cost to stimulus ratio is is very very interesting because obviously in the head it's hard and for the body on the moment it's hard but again it's not it's not as if you're writing you know at the actual uh, power for that for that intern intensity so i think that's very that's really that. interesting like that this is the big one that i think people don't don't really like the benefits of it you know it's it, it's you just want to stop you want to get off <laughs> <It's> ultimately <laughs> everything's screaming to you yeah to yeah, yeah but that, that mental resilience factor when you think of it, this this game is you know get comfortable being uncomfortable and all the cliches and all this you know it's 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 a it's a big benefit to it you know it normalizes conditions um and you feel really good afterwards but mm -hmm. like we, we didn't do it as i as, you, as you've described it is more of a traditional acclimatization protocol yeah whereas I think that works where I, I always that's that's where the majority of the research is based in that sort of it's all all been around the Olympics and what can we do to go mm -hmm. to Tokyo when it's really mm -hmm. hot you know, and we have 10 days so that why the protocols are there whereas I, I I think with us I I always I find when I've done that sort of protocol with guys and girls it's it's kind of too much and it can take the edge off the important stuff you know like, it, yeah it, it takes it takes away a lot of time that's one thing yeah. that i well we kind of did a half and half uh based on what i was going to apply in the first place but obviously with uh, you know how much training in general needs to be done you can't just take out five sessions a week to do your heat stuff so we're trying to go on you know do one session active and then do one session passive kind of a hot bath 20 minutes kind of thing yeah. uh and try to find the happy medium uh but definitely like you said i think the protocols are interesting uh but it's not very uh pl planning friendly given all the other things that need yeah. to be i mean to the, be done. the problem is that the, the basic training is really fucking good like it works <laughs> <laughs> so then it, any 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 additional stress that you're adding on to the, mm. to the athlete you're like it's gotta it can't take away from that basic stuff that works you yeah. know um which is kind of why I like to just open it up. Like, like let's open up the time frame. Let's do it over a, over a year, two years. And like the, there's a lot of research on like the reacclimatizing to the heat of you, you do two weeks and you come back five weeks later, do it again. You, you, you get the benefits a lot faster. Yeah. Um, so by that, just continually drip feeding that stimulus in through the year, I think you do get an additive effect on similar, oh, well, not similar, but you know, it's same sort of concept as like altitude training where you're doing like one camp's good, but three camps is even better. And then mm -hmm. nine camps, you know, it's yeah. long-term development and progression. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it's very interesting that obviously you were using that and also for a sprint event, right? Cause I've spoken to triathletes that, that compete in Ironman and they swear by, you know, sauna twice a week. And this is really something that helps them with heat tolerance and, and, and also the performance side. Uh, mm -hmm. It's very interesting that this, means of training applies uh across the board you know whether you're i, I, I don't or... i don't think we're doing the uh i wouldn't have done it as a, as a sauna i mean i think i think differently on the yeah, yeah obviously active yeah. versus active I'm, i've got pretty pretty strong opinions that you, i think the active is exponentially better um, yeah just yeah i don't think from my point of view part <clears throat> training in the heat is what makes it really hard like unbelievable like almost after after you've done it bath and then you've been on the bike for half an hour i mean you kind of hope it's so horrible that you hope it's doing something for your body but yeah <laughs> i don't think i think there is there's something to the um not you don't want to just sit in the heat or whatever you've got to be getting getting your body moving getting the muscles working yeah well, we could use that heat so like last i mean we didn't do it this season but last year we've done stuff where you like you like preload the heat so you'll do like a hot bath then you'll get off put your paint suit on and jump on the turbo straight mm. away so it's mm. like the 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 metric like we talk we're looking for is time above one and a half one point seven degree shift, and if you can like preload that by having a hot bath where you you will heat up really really fast, then it right. means you can then get the whole sixty minutes at the at the pain game. <laughs> that would be a, I guess that would be a that would be a progression from just hopping on the bike and, and yeah yeah exactly that's that's it but it, it's you know you know basic training you know I can tell you now doing the bath before completely changes your experience <laughs> like, for the, I for cannot, the better right <laughs> uh depends better that you do your description of better but i would say heat training just getting on a bike with the paint suit on has got nothing on if you heat up using the bath before it's like a completely the the, the difficulty level is like 
you go in like a, a four out of ten to like an eight or nine out of ten. Unbelievable! From the minute you step on, it is unbelievable. Like how the difficulty because that it's the first twenty minutes when you're already hot. There's no heat up pace. Like if you're instantly, I'll get on my heart rate will be one fifty at two hundred watts. Like instantly, you're just like Ugh. so. Yeah, and, yeah. and maybe just for reference for the listeners, uh, you said two hundred watts. What would that be in terms of RPE out of ten for you on a normal day off uh, out of the pain? Seat? So <clears throat> let's call my my strict zone two, which is like a one twenty five heart rate or something, would be two hundred and fifty. So two hundred yeah. watts, I would say, would be an RPE maybe two, like right. really, really easy, like yeah. full recovery, and yet you turn it on with all that heat training, and yeah, I would, I would it, it's probably a seven eight plus. Like it is really, really challenging to 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 just about finish an hour with all that. It's it's hard work. Yeah, Johnny, it's can not talk- it's not too hot for the listeners. Like don't don't try and cook yourself yeah about duration at temperature it's not yeah. about how hot you get it's yeah yeah and it's i think it's important also to note and, and johnny can probably add something to this the the importance of not doing super hard stuff in the heat as heat training right the the point is like you said to spend time at temperature and not to kill yourself doing a hard session in the heat yeah well i mean i guess it's like anything it's like i think people people do heat wrong i think a lot of the time because it's like if, if you try and apply the same principles you would do in your normal training to heat training it's fine you know it's progressive overload you know we started with half an hour just the paint suit we built up to 70 80 90 minutes then you add the, the bath before you know it's how could you make the stimulus harder and harder and it's it's long time frames that you have to add it into it's like if you did a vo2 session say and you went so hard that you couldn't do anything for the next three days you'd look back and you'd be like this was wrong <laughs> you know <laughs> i've done something wrong and if you just if you do if you, that's how you feel after a, a heat session then you've you've You've, you've applied too big a stimulus. I guess we could say that to pro- you want to progress heat training like you would progress low intensity training, which is just do more of it, but not necessarily harder. Yeah, exactly. I will, and, and uh, you know, the, the high intensity work. I mean, if we think the, ne- the next little science experiment we did was, was uh, we did a lot of occlusion, like BFR, okay, yeah. in sort of final 12 months. Yeah. An- another way for Phil to have fun. Um <laughs> Talk basically... about that a little bit. How did you how did you implement it? Uh, well, what you do is you kill yourself and then you just cut off all blood flow and you just squirm. <laughs> is the uh, is the protocol? <laughs> um, I mean, it's a BFR. It was a bit of backstory again. Um, uh, Richard Ferguson from Loughborough Uni. This was back when we had a we did a, had a cycling team that did track races. We sort of we had a thing where we would basically just ask smart people what we think we should do because um, we didn't really know what to do. So we were you know let's find out. And he, that was one of his like original ones that he was like, come to come to the uni, we'll do it on you. I, I, I promise it works. Um, but so that was sort of like glowing in the back of my mind for the last sort of six, seven years. Um, and Phil is like the perfect case study of how to apply it, I feel, because it's just just works. Um, and it's for the for the listeners, if you look at uh, uh, Connor Taylor, his his original PhD and then Emma Mitchell built off it around just mitochondrial function. Of post occlusion um mm. and it, the, the original work was done around it was like five to nine 30 second maximal sprints with five minutes rest in the first two minutes of that you're occluded and then you get three minutes wash out and you go again um and a lot of that work was done on quite high level athletes as well um yeah. so it's it, it's it's a good level um there's a lot of limiting factors to it and we had a lot of playing around with how and what and where you can do it um some of my original ideas was you could implement it on the bike i wanted some like bib shorts that had occlusion bands built in so you could just do your training and then you get to the top of the climb or can occlude yourself up descend with no blood flow <laughs> get to the bottom have to sprint into a traffic light and <laughs> <laughs> no release <laughs> um because like you say go back to the original it's got a basic training works you know mm-hmm. So like this little, this, how we sort of used it was an additive to our basic training originally. So for the first sort of 12 months of this in the familiarization period, what we would do is you can just add it to the final rep of your day. Okay. So add, a, add a stimulus um, around that phase for sort of months to sort of get that familiarization development. And was that, 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 you said that was essentially on the, on pretty short, high intensity efforts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want it to you want maximal 30 seconds plus. Like Wind, a Wingate kind of. Um, is it is it a is it a pace 30 seconds or is it an all-out fly and die 30 seconds 
So no, I'll no. I'll put my thing no, no. hand. So in the summer when so last summer when I was I bought the bands and I was like, right, I'm gonna spend some time just just trying lots of different stuff because that that's half half the, the challenge with the BFR stuff is just the amount of time when you're tired and you've got to put it on and the time it takes to inflate and just literally trying to work out can I row with the bands round my quads but deflated or does it rub too much or does it stop me rowing properly because the second that it stops you rowing properly then it's like well you you don't there's no you can't wear them right so right. I remember so I was trying it lots and I even tried I was trying using them occluded during um really light aerobic stuff because I went and read some papers and they tried doing this um and then I remember there was one session in particular. I was like, right, I'm going to try. I don't think it was training with them occluded, but I think I did four or five 30 second absolute maximal. So I think I was doing sort of 900 plus watts for the 30 seconds and then occluding for two minutes and then blowing it off three minutes of flushing and rest and then try it again. And I think I did four or something and it wrecked me for three or four days like johnny said with the paint suit sometimes you know when you've just pushed it far too hard like you've you've tried something completely new and instantly you're like okay that was way too much stimulus and then you come back from there and that's how we kind of came to the conclusion just just probably just use it on your last rep or something because mm. otherwise if you use it on the middle reps you're just wrecking the power output for all the rest of your session really um so you just i mean it is it's a horrible form of training but i, I do think it really helps it's it's good um donnie do you have any how, you... another health and safety notice you've got to be careful how hard you occlude it's not a if right. you too much you'll just get nerve damage and you'll lose a leg so just yeah go for people that want to apply this go educate yourself calibrate it do it properly don't yeah. be an idiot uh don't, don't there's plenty do... of good studies and i there spent yeah. i spent weeks and weeks kind of working up like start at the lowest level and then work up and you kind of you never want to push it right so there's no there's no gains you'll come to a point and you never want to go harder than any of the studies so mm. you just get to that point and you don't even need to i mean i don't even think you don't even need to reach kind of the maximum what they call the maximum safe limit for occlusion i think you can still get a pretty good effect way below that because mm. you're just pushing harder in the piece right because Right. If you were to train normally without occluding, so say you were doing some 30 second max tests or something, you, you did three or four. If you finish that session and BFR wasn't a thing, you'd still be able to finish that session and be in a lot of lactate pain, right? It would still be a really tough because you, you can just push your body. So you don't need to add, you're not suddenly creating this whole new stimulus, right? You're just adding a tiny bit more difficulty for your body to have to overcome at the end of the last mm -hmm. one not adding sort of we're not trying to double the intensity or go from a five to a 10 like 30 second max tests are still going to be an eight or a nine rpe so there isn't that much range really it's just the small it really is just small additions not yeah it's not we're not trying to change the world hey real quick i've prepared a free mini course to help you understand everything that you absolutely need to know on training zones how to train zone two for your sport and how to organize your endurance training in general you can sign up for free using the link in the description and it really highlights the again the importance of applying those ideas practically on the field both the heat training right you didn't just do the you know five days a week or whatever it is uh, you actually fit it in in the way that works in the way that is sustainable but that's always my question when people show me studies to tell me how good sprint interval training is for new people. I say, yeah, that's cool. But after six months of three times a week, you know, four times, 30 seconds all out, are they going to come back and train? I don't know. Um, but going back to what you were saying, uh, Johnny. Do I think it's, is it's also worth, Phil's not a normal person. You know, like the stuff we're doing <laughs> here is, like you say, he's, the, there was there was 20 minutes of war and peace about how he got to this point. You know, like he's very well adapted to, yeah. five meter rowing and doing it you know so it's to to shift a really experienced high level athlete you do need to do something different and push them but it's up. incremental but even for a yeah. guy like him who is you know uh, well above the the average human it's still very uh kind of a, almost micro dosing the the stimulus so that it doesn't take over and then ruin the whole the whole kind of plan um johnny on the occlusion side 
is there a good, do we have a good mechanistic understanding as to what is happening or is there some hypotheses? Why is it beneficial to, to add those occlusions? Yeah, the, well, they, again, I refer you to the PhDs. If you want to read them, that's the best way to learn yourself. But the, uh, the key you're looking for is just an inc increased shear stress on the cell. Mm. If you imagine like when you are occluding, it, it's actually the release where the benefits come of that pressure in the cell. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, uh, what, why does it work here? Um, again, go, go speak to Connor, go speak to Emma. They'll give you a far more eloquent answer than me. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious whether it's mostly on the oxygen utilization side of the cell or if it's on the vasodilation, because I know that yeah. when you occlude, you obviously, your body's trying to bring more oxygen, so it's going to open up all the vessels. And that is one of the one of the side effects, but I'm, I wasn't sure which one was. I think a lot, a lot of a lot of the driver of adaptation is desaturation. Um, and if okay. you can maintain yourself at a lower desaturation for longer in that rest period, then mm -hmm. it's driving further adaptations. Right. Um, we did. I did some just experimenting on me with the occlusion at various altitudes. Um, my friend lives in Andorra. Um, so do, doing BFR at two thousand meters and right. comparing how desaturated you get and this is this is like you can kind of achieve similar levels of desaturation that you would get by doing sprints at altitude with the bfr uh, mm -hmm. okay but it's the exact mechanism I, i'm not quite sure this is the like i say i, I use use their study template and applied it with phil's play, tinkering and playing around you know phil will i think phil did a good job of like I say tinkering because it's it's not it, like you said it's logistically difficult Mm -hmm. that that makes yeah, sense like, so we, we went over the... are like they, they use you know 10 gram machines that goes up right. to pressure within few fractions of a second and they've got two two uh researchers doing each leg and you know it's it, it's chewy yeah there's the there's the science and then there's the the practical application mm -hmm. um so we we did the heat training we talked about the occlusion uh talk a little bit about johnny the um, you talk about the bit of threshold training that you guys did to increase that lactate tolerance uh increase work capacity what kind of format did you use frequency per week leading up to the to the 500 well you, you take it phil um firstly i haven't actually spoken about this but i think this was probably gonna shock the listeners the most i pretty much did maximum of six training sessions a week ever for the last however many years that's it like that is all pretty much my body can handle right mm -hmm. with the sprint load in because i see first like because we're talking about all these other methods and i was just thinking i was like when i speak to most people and a lot of professional athletes like, oh how many sessions are you doing and they go oh i'm doing 14 15 sessions a week and i'm like i i cannot handle that so yeah that, that was the first one to say so the threshold stuff we tried lots of different stuff in reality we tried um this year we last year we tried lots of different methods um some at kind of lower intensities like i would say if we say 250s my zone two we tried stuff so johnny and i agree fully that polarizing the training heavily is really important especially with the sprinting so you don't really want to get in the gray zone <laughs> so there's a little bit of um a little bit of safety about trying not to train anywhere from probably 330 to that 250 zone like we didn't but basically i just never never did any training in that zone um and then in the summer when i was trying to get strong we said look spend a few months and start doing some longer efforts sort of around you might do sets of maybe 12 minutes at 350 watts something like that kind of the longer um longer lower level stuff and mm -hmm. then I'd say as we came closer into the winter, just before I started with like before we'd kind of go into it, so maybe November, December, I started ramping up into some more um VO2 max um style efforts, which might be kind of start with a semi-elongated. So you, you do some work at maybe your the five minute power that you might be able to hold for five minutes. So you might do a couple of minutes with that start draining your fast vo2 component and then we'd get into some sort of mixed um intervals with maybe like one to one two to one um rest work uh and we we played around a bit with varying the wattages um from sort of high threshold to vo2 
um, around that. I think Johnny will probably tell you a bit more science around kind of the buff lactate buffering and shuttling stuff. Um, but I do think, I mean, I think this all has to play with just being able to tolerate higher volume of maximal sprinting load. Um, I think there is something in that. And the real big difference is probably on the back end of the 500s in reality like you could you can get the peak power gets you strong at the start but really i think this year especially um a combination maybe it's really hard to identify what part of the training results in what products in the race right mm -hmm. because even you're still trying out lots of different stuff so it's really hard to say that specific thing made me go fast in that specific area now you can't say but all I do know is that towards the end of the world record effort, I was able to raise the rate in a method that I was not able to do at any time previous. Mm -hmm. Now, whether that's because I had um, better tolerance to the lactate and so I could neuromuscularly still apply some pressure or by whatever function, whether my cells were, I was still had a bit more I had a better glycolytic function in my cells from doing maybe more shuttling work or it, it's really hard to identify. Right. So um... it's, to, to echo what you're saying here though, um, I've, I've, I've been lucky to have, uh, we talked about it um, uh, in, on Instagram. I had Vincent here, who's a master's friends champion four years now on the 500. Uh, and he described the same thing where he added a lot of tempo uh, style work this year, especially in the, in the off season. And it did help him a lot with both work capacity recovery. And he felt like on the back end of his 500, he was also, I guess, not much more tolerant because it, it's yeah. always marginal gains, but he, he definitely felt the difference on that portion himself. Yeah. I think it's different with rowing as well, because there's less of a rate of force production issue. Mm -hmm. Like If you were to do this type of work with a sprint cyclist or a sprint runner, yeah, it would, work. It would, it would take away from the, the key. Right. Where it is you have a long time to apply force to the pedal, uh, to the to the erg. You know, it's, it's, it's right. So it might not be as beneficial when you have a shorter time to apply that force. Yeah, yeah exactly. Mm. Yeah. You talked about the you know those twelve minute repeats. What kind of volume per session were we looking at? Was it kind of a three to five times? You know, twelve minutes on a few minute rest. Yeah, or... yeah, some something. Yeah, th probably do maybe maybe three or four reps sort of thing. Nothing nothing too wild. So. Also, yeah. it's just, there's a bit of, as I said before, there is an aspect. It was always just managing the fatigue so that because we always we made a really big point that don't stray away from the fact that peak power is going to create your best race. So we need to be feeling really good when we turn up for weights and we need to be feeling really good when we turn up for the maximal performance sessions mm -hmm. so that we can absolutely like we want to create. We want to do more always be faster than what we're looking for in those maximal performance sessions and being able to lift the heavy weight so realistically yeah you, you could do an, another set of threshold and maybe you could push it a bit harder um but in reality it's, that's not really going to get you a world record the other stuff's going to do that but th this stuff is just just put it in tick the minutes off and be done with it yeah you you talked about six sessions a week what do those look like in terms of you know, spreading out your strength training, your erg training, your more general bike training. What does that look like in the off season? And then closer to, to the race, if you could give us the kind of a, the picture there. So in the off season, I'd usually try and do, um, it was probably, yeah, two, I'd average about two or three weight sessions a week, like probably alternate two, one week, three, no, nothing too fixed, kind of depended a little bit how I felt. Um, and then within those weight sessions, it would usually be a couple of lower body compounds and then a push and a pull or maybe two pushes or one pull, some, something like that, two pulls. Um, and then it, it was pretty flexible, right? And I was not, I was sort of just doing my own thing, writing my program, but it was mostly all in my head. I kind of had an idea that I would try and do one kind of amber session. So not too hard. And I'd usually put that in the kind of threshold. So that would form... So say we do two weight sessions, I try and do one threshold sort of session or threshold VO2, whatever I fancied, really. <laughs> there was no specific plan. 
and then I would do one endurance ride of pretty much I was like I would try and just go for a, a bike ride or something for 90 minutes um keep it zone two either drifting or outside and then I would try and do one I mean even in this summer I really didn't push the red sessions I really didn't do hardly any sprinting so in reality it would probably be two weight sessions a threshold vo2 potentially one or two of those sessions and then an endurance ride and that that was really it I, I really didn't touch any of the peak power um stuff for probably like four months or something um, essentially keeping it very general right you had yeah a very distinct it, general physical preparation phase where you you weren't you know super uh anal about the reps and the the, the weights and the numbers you were just yeah. doing the work getting the work in and almost staying fresh in your mind so that when you got to the point where it was time to you know get to get to serious work you you had the mental capacity and the physical to do it as well yeah i think i didn't touch the rowing machine for something like three months and then in a weight session i was like right i'm, I'm just going to bang out 100 meter and just see what happened and um it was it was pretty close it was like 0.2 of my best ever so i knew i was kind of like well at least the training's doing something and then i didn't touch the rowing machine again for another two three months so we knew there was it was this is what I said. I was still in pretty good shape, right? When when I got around to sort of September of last year, mm -hmm. um, and then as we kind of moved, once I decided, I was like, right, okay, let's have another go this winter. Let's try and break this five hundred. Then I started changing, so it would probably be more like, um, yeah, the two or three weight sessions, uh, an endurance ride, a sort of thresholdy VO two session, and then there'd be a red maximal effort session. So then I'd start. I was starting getting into doing some sort of 40 seconds 30 seconds full out maximal tests big rests big watts that sort of stuff and then also um occasionally i was just throwing in some starts before the weight session or within the weight session to just get some real peak torque stimulus mm -hmm. like high torque stimulus mm -hmm. um yeah and pretty much just sort of carried on with that i mean as we got closer to the race there is as you say the fitting all the all the items of training you want to do fitting that all into a week and then balancing it with enough recovery is that it's it's really difficult right so um one thing i will have learned i'm really surprised about and even in like since working with Melly and with johnny it's just quite how especially when you're coming towards your peak and you're doing lots of sprint work you can maintain your strength with a surprisingly low amount of strength training like I could maintain my strength of basically doing two sets of maybe three exercises twice a week. Hmm. And you're not making any strength gains, but you're definitely not making any losses. So, and then we would try and by the end, the last few weeks, we'd be combining a kind of mini strength session into the hard maximal training just to combine it into one big ball so that then um, you could have a rest day either side or like you can manage the fatigue a bit better rather than doing a weight session big weight session then having a rest or you are you struggling to do because you can't give two days to it you can't do weights one day and then maximum the other days because you're just running out of time to do all your heat training yeah. and everything you're else running out running out of days and it's yeah. interesting i was i'm digging into the all the rpe papers and you know session rpe monotony and, and those things and how they figured out with they were studying horse horses uh racing horses and if they increased only two or three days of intensity in the week, they got better. But then when they started increasing the intensity of the easy days, they started to show symptoms of overtraining. And so you talked about, you know, polarizing, obviously, the intensity distribution throughout the week. Do you guys feel like it's as important to do over the year like you pretty much did here where you had very little sprint work away from competition and then still, you know, had very good numbers on your on your pure sprint stuff if you if you tried uh but essentially going away from your your competition event uh when you're farther away in the year so they can get back closer to it does that does that make sense yeah absolutely i think very very, very few sports actually do periodization well like because i think if you're a professional athlete you're expected to race and compete basically all year round right so what it, periodization kind of means we're going to have, you know, at your worst, say, you know, take take a track cyclist, you know, like that's a very low race schedule, but you're only ever doing maximum of two and a half months 
building to a competition then you rest two and a half months rest two and a half you know it's that's not whereas i think you know runners and like these marathon runners and all these sort of flow it's like that is period you know it's give me give me six months and like let's see what you can do because it takes takes a really long time to shift physiology mm. and, it, and it's, it's also like the the if we had if phil had kept doing the erg all year round like would that have allowed the aerobic side to grow you know it's not just what you do it's what you don't do that matters um yeah 100 percent agree like it's that mental fresh mental freshness and it's it's almost how how daring are you to get away from what you're supposed to be doing or will be doing on on game day and phil do you feel like your your general yearly planning has evolved in that direction over the years where each year you allow yourself to go farther away from or were you never you know afraid of the because i know a lot of people that compete they're afraid of not feeling in the best shape that they've ever felt and that's one of the things that keep that's keeping them from doing something different for a period of time to then come back stronger did you ever feel that phil or because it that does seem like you're pretty comfortable with your your routine and obviously the sailing in the summer and, and whatnot i think it's semi-enforced right um, I'm completely at ease with not being in peak form. And I think to, as Johnny said, like if you want to make if you want to make good physiological changes, you have to be willing to change something with what you're doing. Because you doing doing the same thing on repeat and expecting a different outcome is just the definition of stupidity. So there's lots of rowers, right? I'll take on water rowers, perfect example. Lots of my friends know it well. They all somehow think that you can, they've rowed for 10 years, well-trained, exceptional athletes, but somehow they think that they'll just decide in their head, oh, for the next two months or six weeks, um, I'm going to get strong. And they just decide it in their head, but nothing else changes in the program. They're still doing the same amount of endurance work, the same amount of threshold work, and the same amount of gym sessions. But they've just decided that, I'm I'm yeah I'm going to I'm going to try and get strong I'm really going to push hard in the gym and then they finish it and they go oh I've made a little gain but I haven't really actually changed my physiology and then within a few weeks pretty much all that gain's gone right you haven't really made a big sustainable change because you're just kind of modulating it in the moment so if you want to if you want to get really strong you've got to back off somewhere you've got to reduce your volume so, something's got to change right mm. so if you want to Like for me, I was like, well, okay, we've tried the real maximal stuff. Let's try and build the threshold a little bit. So that meant, right, ditch all the maximal stuff. Let's work on just a bit of thre like threshold, a little bit of endurance and getting stronger. So we were still able to, still able to keep, you can't, it's good not to throw everything in the bin. So it's kind of like, well, I still know I like to keep the strength because that's mm -hmm. going to give me the power. But I think I can work on this thing at the same time. And it's not going to, not going to be negative to either of them. Right um so but in terms of my choice the sailing enforces that i can't keep the same routine i mean i'm sure there's people out there professional athletes that pretty much do the same routine for 50 weeks a year two weeks off and that's it and they go oh, i'll make these tiny little gains but for me because i'm away here and there and then it kind of means that yeah you gotta you have the opportunity to just go and change it up and really change everything and have mm -hmm. periods of rest and recovery yeah That, that makes a lot of sense. All right, guys, we've gone around the block. Let's come back to it. Phil, you're waking up the day of. How do you feel? Incredible. Honestly, get, I'm still in the bed. Just imagine I'm moving all my body around, trying to work out what that, that, something must hurt. There's going to be something <laughs> wrong with my body. Anyway, get out of bed. Still that feel good. Slept like a baby. Um, feeling rested. Ter terrible, terrible expression, that one. Having stayed with uh, one of my friends. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Babies sleep really badly. <laughs> yeah, it probably is. Um, but also, I don't sleep very well generally. So, okay, I slept like a log. Let's put it that way. That's maybe a better one. That's probably so, a better one. <laughs> sleep well, wake up. So, oh, Dad, don't even feel too nervous. So anyway, um, start having some breakfast, sort of get halfway through breakfast. And I was like, oh, a bit nervous here. We'll just put that to one side. Um, and then I was like, right, I could I have a tendency to kind of just wait around and then it ends up later in the day. I was like, right, this will make it. Start the bike out. And then it starts the clock going, right? Because you, the minute you start that bike out, you're like, right, in 90 minutes, 
around i'm gonna bang it out and there's no there's no two ways about it once you start the process you know it's all the time the clock's ticking so you don't have too much decision there isn't really a decision or any choices to make so we start getting down to it get down to the club done all my pre-race routine uh we actually ended up doing um some some heavy squats as part of my warm-up um mm-hmm. we decided that kind of actually modulated my peak power quite well as part of the warm-up pretty nice yeah. um I remember I just sort of was like, all right, we'll load it up. Won't change anything to it. Put 140 on the bar for some back squat. Um, and I banged out two reps and it, it just felt like air. It wasn't even, it wasn't even hard. And I'm not super strong on the back squat. Like usually kind of to put it in reference, like a set of five at 150, 160 would be pr- pretty tough for me. That would be hard. Um, so I banged it up and I was like, oh, I think I feel really good. Um, anyway, finished the warm up. I remember I sort of set the cameras up, blah, 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 and I was sitting there getting the breathing in, and then obviously I by myself, and I was like, right, let's let's just go for it. So bang it off, come off the start, probably not quite absolute peak power. It's really hard, and you, I'd say stroke four, you probably hit your peak wattage um, that you're ever going to hit in the piece, and I probably knew I was like, very slightly down from that but anyway felt good rhythm straight in <clears throat> i would say the 500 for me pretty much takes care of itself until about 300 meters gone and at that mm. point that's usually that's when my mental game starts and it has done forever and um, it's kind of, you're about sort of 40 42 seconds in it's really starting to hurt the neuromuscular is starting to say please stop pressing your legs so hard um and actually on that day i didn't have a second there wasn't even a second thought i just sailed straight through it there was no no moment where i thought about stopping whether that's because i knew i was going i I was on pace right i could see that i was going faster than the record and i knew i knew if there was going to be a time for me to create the performance it was going to be there and now so got through, and then I also know once I get to 100 meters to go, that'll also take care of itself because I'm not going to stop in that period. So it's it's a really fine line for me. So anyway, got to 400 meters, like right, just keep the legs moving, and you'll see on the video of me doing it, it you can see it, but you can actually hear it in the fan how quickly the fan is decelerating, and there's no chain slap, and you can see the leg are all just sort of starting to stop working and then by the last sort of three or four strokes there's barely any leg and it's really just body and I just remember finishing looking at the screen going oh my god finally it's done like I feel <laughs> that that was the performance yeah and uh, to, to um, echo on what you were just saying there in the last 100 meters uh, your drop off between the start, the first hundred and the four hundred was three and a half seconds from one hundred seven point zero to one ten point five. Mm. And the drop off between the four hundred and the five hundred was one ten point five to one fifteen point five. So five second drop off. So that just yeah. illustrates how difficult that last hundred so, meters. So hold on, I'm just gonna because I don't know it off by heart, but um, the splits. Um, especially once you get up into the, the kind of where we're the sort of splits that we're talking about per 500 mm. can actually be a little bit disguising i find um for the people that it, don't know so to because it's put not it it's, in wattage terms which makes it a little linear. bit obvious right i actually so, have them 107 is 1164 yeah and, and then, then we're finishing at 813 813 so exactly you can see just quite how i mean the gap between my 300 to 400 meters, I did 999, call it a thousand watts. And then we're just 813 for the next 100 meters. So we lost 20% of my wattage yeah. in just on that last thing. So, and if you put that in perspective, so you say, oh, I'm going from a 110 to a 115, you're like, oh, I mean, it's still quite fast. And you're like, if you said to anyone else, you're going to go 20% slower for the last section of the race, you go, wow, that's that sound, that's a lot slower. Like you can't if you looked at that in any other sport, you'd think they're pretty much rowing to a standstill. And that virtually is what you're doing at that point. Yeah. Um, I want to come back on a couple of things. You talked about your breathing before you started. Mm. Do you have a routine that you use before those tests? Do you use it in other places? Talk a bit more about that. 
Um, so in the past, actually, I've I really struggled with um, kind of as asthma um, mm. and symptoms like during both during the efforts and also having really really bad symptoms after a maximal effort mm. so I, I would have a lot where i would do kind of a 500 or 1k flat out and i would just be coughing for days like re really quite severe lung damage um and i kind of knew there was a problem so we played around with some different inhalers and stuff which did actually make it better but also um johnny got me on to um the, these power breathe the just the mechanical that like, intercostal lung trainers yep. now as we say this is the bro science this is the 20 percent. now there really isn't that many studies out there and most of the studies are completed on uh, quite elderly people and um, mostly from um with sort of lung disease or pulmonary um issues so i actually used the lung trainer and i bought kind of the weakest one made for the old people's home and, and I actually worked out, I could pretty much only start on some of the lowest settings. So I knew there was some room. So anyway, I pretty much used that for a whole year. Like I'd take it sailing with me and I'd always use it kind of every other day mm -hmm. taking. And I really felt like I actually um, was able, the difference that I felt is when I was on the rowing machine, I was able to fully open up my diaphragm um, in a much better fashion than I was before, especially um, once the tiredness sets in. So what I find is like, so the morning of that 500 meter, I'd actually use it not not at a really high resistance level, but a lower resistance level. And really just trying to almost, it sounds silly, stretch your diaphragm and your rib, just, just working on making sure you can open up your rib cage and stuff. And a little bit in my warm up, um, I then this year, especially, I would spend time in the easy section of my warm up, um, actually thinking about opening up my lungs as much as I can and really working to do that because especially the warm-ups for sprint stuff it you're doing such a short time not necessarily you're kind of working the lungs that much and then you get to the effort where you suddenly want to switch it on and go oh I need as much air I need this big tidal volume and then nothing's really woken up there so I do think there's a little bit in um a little bit of mentality and a little bit of practice for me and and in reality I had less dependency on using inhalers and less side effects after the efforts than I ever had before after kind of implementing those changes. Mm. But there's no kind of, I wouldn't say I do any Wim Hof style breathing or real like breath work or anything like that. It's pretty low level and it's all pretty um, athletic. So yeah. that's for next year, mate, that is. <clears throat> Bringing well, the I I mean, back to the, back to the bro science, I, I actually use respiratory training quite a bit with my yeah. CrossFitters and, and I do see the same, you know, benefits that you outline, especially before a very intense effort, you can warm up, but sometimes it's going to be 30 minutes before you step on the floor and all those things. So having that to kind of stress your respiratory system and we know the importance of, and especially in rowing, you know, that the importance of the diaphragm to stabilize your spine as you're, you know, putting all that power into to the machine it, it, it makes total sense that if you can warm up that muscle better and all those structures that they're going to just be there, just like you can potentiate, you know, your squat or your, your, your power output and your strength with a squat before that, it's essentially doing the same thing with the diaphragm and, and the respiratory system. Um, it's interesting that you're, you're using that device as well. Johnny, I just sent you a paper, uh, that my friend just, uh, published something like today about the practical application of respiratory training in endurance sports. Um, it, I think there's definitely some things moving in, in very interesting directions uh, on in that regard. Um, but it's- I rate it's, it highly. Like it's um, from my personal experience, I use a yeah. similar thing, but uh, it's also, um, cause I was, I was, I'm, I was asked, well, I am so I, quite bad asthmatic. Um, mm. I, I always found whenever I went on an altitude camp, one of the side effects was I'd come back and I wouldn't need to use an inhaler for- right. Because you've just breathed at a really high frequency, really high depth for. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's, it's it's a real, like I say, it's a it's definitely in the realms of bro science. But I think it's it's probably not the first. It's not your juicy melon that you pick on the floor, but you know there's there's a little cherry, it's like or a little yeah. little pomegranate right at the top that you can grab. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 definitely very interesting. Um, Phil, coming back to you know the execution, did you do any visualization of? the event itself of the lead up to it? Is that anything that you've 
done or played with at all? No, I try not to think about it at all. Zero. <laughs> if I think about it, I opposite strategy. It. Yeah. So I, I, if I if I think about it at all, I freak myself out. So it's better not to think about it whatsoever for me. <laughs> That's I don't know if you noticed because like, I didn't talk to you at all about it. So like, because I remember last yeah. last year we talked about it all the time. Yeah. Uh, I, I, like one of my little lists was like, I've scared the guy. <laughs> <laughs> was that was that a conscious was that the conscious choice, Johnny, to not bring it up this year? Yeah, especially in the last few days. I think it, it was the day of. I sort of sent you a little message, be like, "You're gonna do it today." <laughs> yeah. but I was like, because yeah. like you say, I think it's a, you, you you you're so experienced, you know what to do. You can only overthink these things. Yeah. No, that's that's very interesting. Phil, talk about the technique on the 500 meter sprint. There's obviously, you know, textbook how to do things on a 2000, um, but the 500, there's a lot more approaches to it. And obviously, you know, how you're built, what you're built for might also impact that. Can you share your perspective on, you know, what the t optimal technique might be on a 500? Um, so the 500, I think there's some parameters that you have to... They, there's, there's lots of variables, right? As Johnny said, so variables include your foot position. So how your foot stretch your position up, down your drag factor. Then we can modulate how many strokes a minute you're taking. And we can modulate how hard you're pulling and we can modulate your drive length. So at some point you have to try and decide, right, what are we going to try and fix? And I, but by fix, I mean, work within a small zone because you're not going to, it doesn't need to be definitive, but you have to try and decide somewhere. Else, okay. We're going to, we're going to row at 50 strokes a minute. Now for me, I think that my best 500s are produced by rowing at somewhere between 48 to probably 51, 52 strokes a minute. That's, that's basically my, my sweet spot. I think, mm -hmm. I think any higher than that, I think you're just, um, you just waste, there's just literally the dynamic, of going up and down the slide moving all your body parts and um, there's just too much you're you're probably wasting energy right because there's probably something else that's lacking and then um so we say that and then i've spent years and years growing at sprint and i spent a little bit of time last year and this year just trying to work on my technique a little bit to get a slightly better leg compression mm -hmm. um but generally, if you look at my data, I row about one meter forty is my drive length, and and that's pretty much fa fairly consistent. So I was like, right, we've locked in um, the we've locked in these items. Let's go with that. And then so I went right. What can I modulate? And we went drag factor. So we tried every drag factor. I've tried everything from one fifty all the way up to two twenty, all across all the different lengths. And I go right. Okay, actually, for me, um, I think. 190 is about the number mm. so that was what's your sorry what's your max deadlift my max deadlift uh really hard to say i don't i don't do any conventional so we do okay. um some partial trap bar stuff and i'll mm. do maybe 250 kilos for sets of uh, four or five okay so i i wouldn't say i'm a, i'm an incredibly strong athlete on anything lower body that's just the big surprise like if you look at some of the other guys that do the 500 they can squat at Chris Scott, who's one of the English guys. You see him back squatting 240 kilos. And to me, it just blows my mind. I'm like, how? Because you're six foot five. He's not a small guy. There's just, it's a long, there's a, there's a massive distance that he's lifting it through. And the other guy that I raced last year, Cam, I mean, I don't know what he deadlifted, but there was a lot of plates, like mid 200s, it must have been on a conventional barbell deadlift. Yeah. So there's a bit of difference um, there. So this year, Last year we tried everything, and this year we did. I think we were just set right. I kind of knew. Well, we know my drag rector. I knew how the style and the sort of technique that I wanted to row, and I knew the stroke rate. So then, it's basically just kind of modulating how hard you're going to push. Right. right. Everything else is fairly set. How is there any modulation of effort throughout the uh, the um, the piece? Or is yeah, it so. And that's what we get to. So I've tried the race plan. So in re reality, kind of my race plan that I ended up using for the effort is absolutely as hard as you can for six seconds. That's the that's the freebie. You got your ATP system. Let's just burn it out. And then probably from there, 
there's a very slight downshift. Now, it's really marginal. It's not this huge downshift to a cruise phase. It's just backing off. So what in my head, what I thought about is not chasing the rate. So it would be you're pressing hard, but you're not, I'm not chasing and trying to get higher and higher and think and the wattages. So we're just coming down very slightly. But I mean, it, we're talking still 95% effort. It's not much from there. Right. But my main, I, I would say, if anything, power almost takes care of itself for me. My main effort, especially through that first 200, is working on making sure I'm getting enough leg compression and rowing technically really well, knowing that if I can keep my efficiency there, that it's going to pay for it later down the line. Mm. Then going from, I've rowed 200 meters. Now it's... <clears throat> It's still pretty easy, right? The rate's still high. Um, I'm just making sure that I'm taking low. At it. And I know somewhere around this kind of 250, so the midpoint, I'm going to probably come start hitting split at or slower than my target score. Right. So there's a little bit of a mental game, but a lot of it is your neuromuscular system hasn't stopped you working yet. So you're still able to hit the splits. You're going slightly slower, but in terms of your technical ability, you can still row the stroke perfectly well. Right. And then it was the difference that I was able to achieve this year was kind of 300 meters road to 400 meters road, where if you look at my score, I was able to raise the rate. And that is basically the first time we've ever been able to do that as, mm. as the fatigue set in. Um, there's not much you can do about power, right? You, you're still pulling, as Johnny said, pretty much every stroke is as hard as you can take. Right. That, that's basically the general ethos, like within a couple of percent. So from three to 400, I was able as my power dropped, I basically that, that that's when I started to sort of chase the rate. And in my head, what I think is ju just keep it moving, just keep just take another stroke, just keep it moving, keep it tapping. Don't focus on trying to leg press every stroke, just try and keep the rate. But basically, my thought was try and keep the rate above 50 for as long as you can. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, the rest will take care of itself in the knowledge that I've taken so many strokes on an ergo over my life that I'll probably row in an okay technical fashion and I'll probably compress my legs as far as they'll go just by just by instinct rather than thinking about it and then honestly the last hundred there's nothing you can do you're just trying to finish there's no um there's no thought about technique it, it, if I had if I could use my neck to pull the handle I would use my neck at that point um which is which is probably fair given how much pain you're in on yeah. the leg side and, and everything else yeah well there's a nice video uh, the full length video that he's not posted it includes about 20 minutes of phil on the floor like <laughs> <laughs> it's very like versions of pain as it like slowly regains consciousness <laughs> it's when about right the yeah, I always laugh when people will tell me, um, and I know other people are 500 the same, and some, someone comes up and they say, oh, 2K is the most painful rowing distance. It's the ultimate test of physiology. And I would love for them. And then occasionally you see people who's like, I can't explain how much pain you can put yourself through in 70 seconds and how it will take you 30 minutes to recover. Like Even to me, I will sit, I was probably on the floor for virtually 20 minutes after the effort. And it, it still blows my mind that you can create that much stimulus in your body that you, that the amount of fatigue that you can create in virtually one minute is just, it's mind blowing to me. Uh, Johnny, I'd love your, uh, your perspective on that. That's something I have heard, Phil. Uh, and it's interesting for me to think about, you know, different archetypes from what you're describing, you know, you don't tolerate a huge amount of a volume, you're a very strong, powerful athlete. You're definitely more on the power side versus the more endurance type of athletes that we might see. And I, from what I, from what I can see, I think somebody powerful like you can hurt themselves more on a 500 and somebody more endurance will hurt themselves more on a 2K, maybe even a 5K um, relative to essentially what you're, what you're built for. What do you think, Johnny? No, totally. It's, if, if you're not, you know, um, if you can't produce the force, then you, if your ceiling's not there, I think right. uh, there was a guy called John Archbold. He's um he was on our track team back in the day, and he was he was famed for having his five minute power. That's you know is uh, sorry his peak power was was what, what's the way right around his five minute power was fifty percent of his peak power, 
you know it's a so he he would do like there's a there's a race on the track called the kilometer which is one kilometer it takes about a minute and a bit um and he, his you look at his sort of heart rate trace through this kilometer and he's his heart rate is recovering by the end of the race because he's got no ability to go deep <laughs> um you know you just can't access that physiology I mean, right. this is like we say like all this stuff that feels done you know like is you know mummy and daddy phil have a lot of lot to say for this you know they they right. put the they put the genes in there um you, you can only tweak what's there i think at this sort of high level um there's, there's a lot of there's a lot of fast twitch in there yeah there's, there's there definitely is um i know you guys have uh, other meetings shortly after i don't want to keep you much longer phil any other records on the horizon for next year are you thinking about this are you just enjoying the moment for now um i think i've put 500 to bed honestly it's been so many years trying thing and i this is the first time and i think oh you know what i i think there was a great performance and i'm kind of just really happy with it um there'll always be something right i i'm never i i i i really actually do enjoy the training and i actually really enjoy the journey uh, for me working being able to work with johnny is part of the journey and going and trying the new stuff and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't and that's all part of the fun for me if we were just if i was just doing the same old that someone had done before it, yes it would be fun and you'd get the endorphins but whether you make the record or not I enjoy the, the the journey for me is the part that I enjoy. So for sure, there'll be another record. Um, maybe it's a 1K. I, I don't, I, the longer stuff just doesn't interest me. And I'm really selfish in this manner. Someone says, oh, why didn't you try a 2K? And I'm too selfish. I only want to do something if I can be really good at it. Because personally, that's what drives me. So it needs to be a goal that I think that I could be the best at. And um Let's find a distance maybe next year that works for that. I like so it. Let's, go, let's go back to the start again. Are you motivated by being beaten or are you motivated by, you know, <laughs> trying to achieve greatness? You've you got, you got to decide, Phil. Come on. <laughs> oh, there's too many decisions right now. <laughs> Could you Ask give me, me after I break really the next nice world record. Of both sides of the coin. <laughs> yeah, it depends on, depends on the day. Depends on the day. Um, well, maybe it depends on who's beating me. Maybe that's more of it. Yeah, yeah, there you go. There you go. Uh, no, you know, see what you say if someone breaks it. Breaks it. Yeah, I thought about that, but you know what? I actually, I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. I'm pretty content yeah, right yeah. now. Well, we'll see what he actually says when somebody does break it. <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> hopefully not too soon. <laughs> yeah. He um, still has to take me up for his one with the offer of the one k. Yeah, well, go on, come on, give me, give me at least two weeks of requiem. Give you a day off. Uh... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It wasn't a day off. You requested that about twenty minutes after I finished the five hundred. <laughs> I think it, I think it would work. I think, I think it'd be. Yeah, I think I'd test my theory. All right. Well, we'll, we'll see it here you guys, first. We'll see you guys next year for uh for the next little bit of news. Then, uh, Johnny, where can we find you online if we want to follow what you're up to? Um, oh, I try and avoid online as much as I can. Uh, probably Instagram if you want to find me, Johnny Whale. Um, that's about it. That's good enough. We'll put the link in the description. How about you, Phil? Yeah, Instagram. Um, hopefully I'll I might try and share some a few of my insights um from training the five hundred because I think it's important um that some of the communities able to see that it uh, firstly how you did it, but also it's um. It didn't just come, it didn't just happen by chance. There's a lot that goes into it before and after. I think um, it might change some people's views, especially with uh, it's going to be a bit of a change around in rowing soon with the advent of um, beach sprint rowing and mm. uh, the Olympic distance changing to 1500. Hopefully, we can um, maybe get some of these older generation coaches and stuff to open their minds a little bit to maybe there's. Maybe there's a different way to create the same end result. I like that. And uh, I want to thank you both for coming on the podcast and talking talking openly about, you know, all this, everything that you tried, everything that you did. And like you said, opening the door to other people, pushing that 
thought process further and, and trying to advance, you know, not only the sport, but just, you know, sport performance in general. So a big thank you to both of you for your time and uh, all your insights. And I uh, hope to see you again on the show. Take care, guys. Thanks a lot for watching this episode. If you want to support the show, there are two good ways that you can do so. You can leave a five-star review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, or you can help grow this community by sharing this episode on your social media. Thanks for your support, and I'll see you in the next episode.